So let's jump into it then. We sure. might get a few other people trickle it in, but um, but uh, I'm very happy that um, Bob Paladino can join us here. Um, and you know, I, I know Bob just online through Twitter. He's been incredibly helpful as I've been learning more about mammals, especially human evolution. You know, book writing stuff. And he's part of this really incredibly diverse and dynamic group in Germany, studying you know like all aspects of human origins. I mean, you guys are publishing. You know, somebody in the group's like many papers a week. You know, you see this stuff online about new human fossils, new studies of, you know, kind of the environment of the time of human origins, new dating of new fossils, new tools, you know, all this stuff. And so much is coming out of your group. It is super exciting just as somebody who's far outside the field for me just to see all the new stuff you guys are doing. And, and I think, you know, until I really got into the human evolution stuff to start researching the book, I was really under like that extreme misconception that like you know the big story had already been figured out and it was like you know just a lot of people kind of bickering over the details including you know some real personalities but no like you guys are finding so much all the time and just like the number of papers new sites and new species and new types of tools and all this being published is great and the environment thing, and this is what Bob's going to talk about. There are so many things you read in the textbooks and you just hear about, you know, human evolution and the environment, forests and grasslands and cooling and drying and kind of humans, you know, starting to walk upright and get bigger brains as the climate is changing. And it's a much more complex story than that. So I'll hand it over to Bob to take over. And I really, really am looking forward to this. And I know for a lot of us, we haven't really done human evolution stuff in this group. So this is a chance for, for any of you guys, I think, that have any questions about human origins, uh, hominid evolution, anything like that, about archaeology also, uh, to chat with Bob. So take it away, Bob. It's going to be a lot of fun. Awesome. Thanks a lot. That was an awesome introduction. Just real quick, can you see my, my slides, my slide screens? Perfect. Uh, yeah, like I said, uh, really, really appreciate um, the invitation to give this talk today. Uh, your group is also doing some incredible work, and it seems like you're publishing just as often as we are. Um, as you were saying, I have a great support team here. I am uh, really fortunate to be a, a postdoc at the Max Planck Institute for the Science of Human History here in Germany, um, and really get to work with some incredibly inspiring people who are doing really some excellent work in archaeology, and not just um, you know human origin stuff or, or early Homo stuff, but up until uh, the Holocene or even a few hundred years ago, looking at dairying and and uh, the development of agriculture and and uh, sort of domestication of crops. So there's some really cool uh, work being done here. So thank you for that shout out. Just a little bit about me. Uh, I am a postdoctoral fellow in paleo environmental biomarkers here at Max Planck. So basically what that means is I, I typically use different uh, organic proxies, plant waxes for the most part, to reconstruct past environments through isotope analysis, um, mainly carbon and hydrogen. And, and I've done work uh, you know, as far back as two million years in, in East Africa, but up until about 2000 years ago in China as well. Um, looking at some of the environmental context of the Great Wall building in northwestern China and how different environments and human interactions sort of led to um, regional environmental degradation in, in northwest China. Um, I did my PhD at the University of Calgary. Uh, I graduated in 2019 and after that I came here to Germany. Um, so actually not too far from the Royal Tyrell Museum and the Badlands. Um, uh, and Drumheller, you know, those kind of famous dinosaur fossil localities. And then a bit beyond there is the, the Burgess Shale, uh, so kind of on the border between Alberta and British Columbia. Um, so kind of going back even further in time. Uh, yeah, today I'll talk to you guys uh, about environmental complexity and human origins. And when I say human, I, I basically mean any of the species that sort of fall under the genus Homo or closely related in Australopithecus and Paranthropus going back about three million years, and I'll sort of use the word human uh, quite generally um, in, in that regard. And we'll take a look at a few different things, sort of the difference between climate and, and environment and how, you know, localized versus regional differences all sort of played a role into the development of our genus and, and tool use and things like that. Um, 
So why are we interested in this? Well, I, I think if you even look at today, not since the, like, the great oxidation event, uh, what, two billion years ago, has a species had as big of an impact on global climate and environmental systems as Homo sapiens. I mean, you can just see it in, in current uh, weather patterns changing, where we have these more extreme dry seasons with fires, uh, you know, raging for months, whether it's down in Australia or California, these huge changes to, to uh, ecosystems, to mining activities. The fact that we have microplastics at like the, the bottom of the ocean, but also at some of our highest peaks, melting of the poles, uh, forest degradation and, and human and, and uh, sorry, uh, other species extinctions. I mean, as a species, we have such an impact on the environment that some people even consider the modern you know, era to be a new geologic age called the, the Anthropocene. Um, and that is really significant. Um, so we kind of have to, you know, look at that and how humans are now modifying our environment. But we have to also remember that we are still susceptible to the same evolutionary pressures as every other species alive and all of the ones that were, went extinct beforehand. We are no different in terms of the evolutionary trajectory on our planet, um, whether or not we are really impacting it uh, to such a, to a large degree. And I think there's really no better look at this uh, in terms of sort of the last million or so years and really how the genus Homo emerged and, and sort of Neanderthals and Denisovans and some of these other species that really only died out relatively recently, leading to us to be the only species, and then of course go on and, and colonize the planet, and, and you know, even have, now we have archaeology on Mars, or eventually we'll have archaeology on Mars, because we've sent rovers and, and a helicopter to Mars. So as a species, we just keep expanding and expanding, and, and I think that's really fantastic. Um, but like I was saying, we, we do really need to remember that we are still evolving and environments, climates are still evolving. And, and um, one of the main research questions in paleoanthropology is what role, if any, environments and climate had on early human evolution. And that's kind of what we'll focus on today, um, mostly with a, a focus on Africa. But I do just want to point out and although we'll be talking mostly pre-2 million years ago, um, by 2 million years, or about 1.8, uh, Homo erectus, the first uh, uh, Homo species with sort of the same body proportions as modern humans, smaller brain, but, uh, you know, subcranial morphological features were very similar to modern humans. They were already over the, you know, Eurasia by about 1.8 and definitely by 1.6. Uh, so although we'll focus on Africa today, you do have to remember that um, even by, you know, what, 1.5, 1.8 million years ago, Homo erectus had experienced a lot of different environments from open grasslands to closed forests, wetlands, coastal, you know, coastal um, environments, even snow and, and high altitudes, whether they're out in front of, you know, glaciers and things like that. So we have to remember that for most of the history of our genus, we have been, you know, adapting and exploiting these different environments uh, throughout the world. So really, really exciting stuff. Um, I'm sure this is just a review for a lot of you, but I, I will be using different terms. Uh, and I just wanted to make sure that we're on the same page. So I'll mostly use the word term hominin. And when I say hominin uh, down here in green, uh, I'm basically referring to Homo aeruginus. Um, the Australopithecines, uh, so Australopithecus and Paranthropus. So basically the upright walking uh, species that directly, you know, led to modern humans. Um, and that differs basically from hominid with the D. Uh, for, for the other ex extent apes, you know, chimps, bonobos, um, gorillas and orangutans and gibbons, um, where I would kind of put them under hominids where they're closely related to us, but they're not bipedal, right? Or they're not, uh, you know, habitual bipedalism. And there are a few species in the fossil record as well uh, that sort of fall in there, which we'll talk about today. You'll notice that Artipithecus here is in yellow because Artipithecus is sort of the debate going back and forth whether or not it was a, a, the earliest hominin on our evolutionary family tree, if you will, 
or if it was just another sort of extinct ape that lived throughout the, the Miocene and, and Pliocene, and how does it really fit on our, our tree? Uh, so we'll kind of talk about that a little bit today. All right, so in terms of environmental change and human evolution, really going back to Charles Darwin and then again uh, uh, to Raymond Dart in about 1925, some of these early hypotheses that for some reason still have a lot of uh, discourse in the literature is that what led to the genus Homo was basically an opening of the East African or South African landscape. Going from a more forested environment where the last common ancestor between chimps and humans lived, and then as it gradually dried out, that last common ancestor sort of split into the different lineages, one that would become modern humans and one that would become modern chimps. Uh, and it basically was like a stepwise process, right? You know, things opened up, this allowed us to become bipedal, and because of that, it allowed us to use our hands for other things, using tools, which then reduced our teeth, uh, basically our canine size, you know, if you were to compare our canines to chimps, much, much smaller. Um, and then tool use allowed for, you know, expanded diet, including hunting, which then, you know, more calories, so brain expansion, uh, which then led to more technological advances and more complex society and language and things like that. So basically, it was just this, this all it really took was a push from a savanna environment to, uh, excuse me, a push from a, a forest environment to a more open grassland that sort of propelled um, modern human evolution. And as recent as 1994, or recent, I say that like it's not that long ago when in fact it's almost 30 years, and which is insane. Um, but, but really uh, where a lot of this came out of and, and was the fact that, um, well, we'll get to it, is this thing called the East Side Story. And it's looking at the distribution of modern chimps and gorillas and how they're mostly focused in the tropical forest of Central and West Africa and where we find our hominin fossil localities, which are in the drier savanna uh, sort of grassland biomes of East Africa from Ethiopia down into Tanzania and then of course in South Africa. And this sort of prompted the idea that, well, about 10 million years ago when rifting in East Africa started, um, there was a separation of our last common ancestor and the, the hominin, the homo lineage evolved in this drier, uh, more open landscape where chimps and gorillas continue to evolve in the tropical forest. And of course, there are some issues with this. Um, one, the, the, the biggest issue is that in tropical environments, fossils don't remain. Uh, they're broken down quite easily. Um, acidic soils and things like that. So it's a lot more difficult to find fossils in these regions where chimps and gorillas live mostly, as opposed to the drier uh, environments of Eastern Africa and obviously the cave sites of Southern Africa. The other thing is there just hasn't been that many research projects focused on you know, the Congo or the Congo Basin looking for these early two million plus year old species. And I know um, lately, there's been a bit more of a push looking in Western Africa, uh, finding some really interesting stuff going back a million years, uh, if not earlier, um, which might sort of, uh, you know, sort of change our perspective on this. But this was sort of the, the push uh, lately was that, okay, so there was a kind of a change in the environment in East Africa, which led to our lineage. And uh, as we see, and as we'll see today, uh, this doesn't really hold up so well anymore. And this sort of mindset change uh, really began in the 80s and then in the 90s in that, you know, climate, environment, it's a lot more complex than it just got dry and, and humans evolved. And when we kind of go look into it uh, within the last 10, 12 years, we see that this East Side story doesn't really hold up anymore, nor does the Savannah hypothesis at all. Uh, so what I'm showing here are some isotope uh, reconstructions using plant waxes. And on the surface of you know, all aerial parts of plants, they produce these waxes. And within the waxes are different types of lipids. And these lipids survive in the geological record pretty well. 
uh, specifically in ocean and lake basins, and there's some great records going back 55 million years, if not a bit older. Um, and there have been a few, you know, deep sea drilling projects focused on Northeast Africa, uh, off the coast of, you know, Ethiopia, Somalia, and that region. And when they were combined with pollen, they found that at about 12 million years ago, there was an expansion of C3 grasses. So C3 grassland started expanding in East Africa, or Northeast Africa, about 12 million years ago. And then at about 10 million years ago is when we start seeing the expansion of C4 plants. And over the last 10 or so million years, Northeast Africa becomes a bit drier and a bit more open. And sure, that fits in with this whole East Side story and the Savannah hypothesis. But 12 million years and then 10 million years really is, you know, six, seven million years before the first good evidence for bipedalism. And then seven or so million years before the early stone tool use and about 7.2 or so before the homo stance. Um, comes onto the scene. So uh, I, I'd say that that data, and of course other projects and, and other research and other lines of evidence, sort of show that grasslands expanded way before bipedalism. And as we'll take a, a look in a few slides, um, the earliest species on our evolutionary family tree, uh, they were actually still living in much close, closed woodland forest environments. So lately there's been a, a much larger push for new uh, in hypotheses in terms of climate or environment, uh, and mostly these focus on variability. Now, I won't look uh, into all of these specifically. If you want to talk about it later, we can. Um, I'll sort of just sum it up into a, a broad category that basically says as climate in, in Africa sort of shifted between wet and dry phases, sort of coinciding with glaciation or, or changes in Earth's orbit, it created um, these, these sort of environmental, you know, stressful periods versus these other periods that were much better off climatically, environmentally, more resources, things like that. And it was really this variability back and forth that sort of drove human evolution, not so much just the change to a drier, more open environment. And, and I think there's much better evidence for this as being a, a you know, a, a pretty good hypothesis for evolution of species, not just humans, but, but other species throughout the, the Pleistocene. So you might be familiar with the, uh, you know, orbital cycles of Earth, the, the Milankovitch cycles, um, which have these different phases, you know, obliquity, eccentricity, and precession that change, uh, you know, sort of at 100,000, 40,000, and 20,000 years. And really throughout the, the Pleistocene, um, we see good evidence for this, especially, you know, after 2 million years. I know um, what we're showing here only goes back in, in this figure about 800,000 years, but kind of the same idea in that you have these changes of the Earth's rotation around the sun or its wobble on its own axis or its own tilt. And all of this changes the, the you know, incoming solar radiation and whether or not ice forms at the poles and then how that impacts tropical hydroclimate, whether it's drier or wetter, and what that does for ecosystem configuration, you know, more plants and stuff like that. And we see these, you know, uh, 100,000 time scale for eccentricity and how that can be reconstructed in terms of East African environments. Or if we look at the processional scale, um, which is at 20,000, we actually see really good evidence um, in East African lakes going back 2 million years and how this configures uh, plant landscapes. Um, so again, focusing on the, the, the plant waxes, this is a uh, precipitation reconstruction um, from the Chicana Basin in Kenya. And sort of following along that processional scale, these sort of 20,000 year um, ch changes. So if you look here, anytime the peaks sort of go towards the top of the screen, it becomes wetter, uh, more indicative of more precipitation in East Africa. And when you have that, you sort of have lake expansion and dense vegetation stands growing up, you know, more forested environments versus the opposite, where it gets drier, there's less precipitation, uh, the landscape sort of uh, opens and you have, have more grasslands. And it really is this variability that we see, you know, some major uh, events in human evolution. And I'm not trying to draw correlations, 
Um, but like some of these drier periods, you might see uh, migrations of humans uh, across Africa or even into to Eurasia. Um, the appearance of stone tools assemblages like the Etrurian, which we'll talk about later on, or even the Middle Stone Age. And again, really, it's this variability, you know, on these 20,000 year time scales that are kind of driving human evolution in terms of the hypothesis. But of course, there are also problems with this. Uh, and as uh, we'll, we'll get into, climate, you know, at these time scales, and I think it's often easy for us archaeologists, paleoanthropologists to sort of confuse climate and environment in the past because they're not the same. What you might have in terms of your climate record does not specifically speak to what was going on environmentally at hominid occupied environments. Um, and really the pathway to environmental change from climatic factors really is complex and that's really what we're going to get into now. So one of the big things that we can't often see in, in climate records is seasonal changes in precipitation. And today uh, in, in Africa, what really sort of drives precipitation amount and, and where rainfall falls across the continent is the intertropical convergence zone and the, the Congo air basin. And these are largely driven by you know, insulation uh, coinciding with you know, winter and summer months, where in July, um, you know, the, the ITCZ might get pushed further north and you have more extensive rainfall going further north on, on the continent uh, versus in you know, January, for example, where it doesn't travel as far upwards and rainfall is sort of uh, kind of resigned to, you know, again, the Congo area or, or, or more Southern Africa. Um, but again, so this is kind of driving our seasonal rainfall patterns on a yearly scale, which can be very hard to document uh, and with our paleo proxies. And of course, this doesn't really take into account what I'm showing here, uh, the influence of the Indian Ocean, for example, and changes in, in seasonal or yearly monsoon patterns and how that drives um, precipitation coming off the Indian Ocean into, for example, East Africa or, or Southeastern Africa. But as you can see here, uh, for Africa, rainfall, freshwater and rainfall really dictates what types of vegetation are growing around the continent. And you can see where the heaviest rainfall falls is where we have our nice, uh, lush, dense tropical forests. Um, whereas the drier areas, obviously the deserts, the Sahara, and then Namib. Uh, but if we look at East Africa, you know, less rainfall, sort of more open uh, savanna, woody grasslands. But there's also a caveat to that, in, in that um, there are these sort of microhabitats that, that can exist in, in areas that are out of sync or out of equilibrium with modern climate uh, regimes. And if we look here at Lake Manyara in northern Tanzania, um, and if you sort of look along this escarpment that sort of runs along the, the western and northern edge of the lake, and you'll see this dense forest that grows, and that's because there's fresh water percolating out of the highlands uh, across the, the escarpment, and where the forest develops is where the, the fresh water is coming out as groundwater, and you get this really lush, dense, almost tropical forest that you would see in you know, Western and Central Africa in a region that only has about 600 to 650 millimeters of rainfall a year. And again, that can be really difficult to pick up you know, in our paleo proxy record, but this is really interesting because the species that you see in these forests might not live in the drier uh, grasslands or savanna biome a couple kilometers away. Uh, and, and I think we have to take that into consideration too, that throughout the last two million years, there were these different, you know, micro habitats that humans and, and other hominins were exploiting or traveling to and from, and, and that's what we're gonna get into now. Um, so, you might be familiar with some of these species, uh, really the earliest hominin candidates, and like I said, these we'll all consider these hominids, but at the same time, there's still this push to find who was the earliest you know, species on our evolutionary family tree that gave rise to the Australopithecines and then Homo, and there are a few candidates that have been put forth in the last 20 or so years. Uh, and, and the earliest, geologically speaking, was 
Sahelanthropus chidensis, found in Chad, which right away should make you go, whoa, that's crazy, that's out of East Africa, um, that's not what this you know, East Side story should uh, or predicts you know, for earliest bipedalism. It's, it's sort of away from what we typically know for early hominins, um, and, and that's cool, but lately uh, there's, there's maybe this was more of a Miocene ape as opposed to an early hominin. Um, the early evidence for bipedalism was the position of the frame and magnum underneath the skull, and the, the early authors suggested that because of its position, it meant for a spinal column directly under the skull, which you see in you know, modern humans, for example, and that was the evidence for bipedalism. But when you look at that, it actually doesn't vary too much for the modern range of, uh, of gorillas or chimps, uh, or even uh, homo for that matter. So the, the frame and magnum is not really quite a good indicator in this case. And then there was a recent study that came out last year looking at the femur, and they basically concluded that, right, uh, if you look at the femur, it doesn't look like it was a facultative uh, biped. Um, it might have some bipedal characteristics, but really we need more information in terms of the, the lower uh, fossil morphology. Much better evidence comes from Auroran in, in uh, Western Kenya about six million years ago. And if you look at the femur here and the femoral head, uh, it's much better adapted for bipedal walking. Um, and really interesting uh, candidate for maybe a, a, an early species that was able to um, walk upright while it was still living in trees. Uh, the problem with this is that a lot of the fossil material, the 20 or so fossils that were found, um, they're now locked away in a bank vault in Nairobi. And I don't know who has access to them to actually restudy them. So I'm not sure what kind of work is being done on, on these fossil remains. And then of course, the more famous uh, discovery, slightly younger, um, is the Artipithecus. Uh, Arty, uh, the, the really famous, because um, it has you know, one of the most complete fossils of, of any of these early hominins. And it really does have characteristic um, lower body morphology su suggesting bipedalism. And that comes in the hips and, and the, in the legs. But you'll notice upper body wise, it definitely still has um, adaptations for living in trees. You know, these really long arms, giant hands, uh, the, the sort of um, big toe that's off of the, the main foot uh, from the other toes, still still grasping, with still grasping capabilities. Um, and if we sort of want to reconstruct this environment, there have been some studies that have looked at, you know, kind of the stable isotopes from faunal remains, just the morphology of the species itself and other species that lived alongside it, and things like phytoliths and pollen remains. We get a, a pretty good indicator of Artipithecus, Artipithecus ramida, so about 4.4 million, and its environment was very dense. It was sort of a, a riparian forest uh, in northeastern uh, Ethiopia, and it's what we think is that, yeah, okay, it was bipedal, it likely had the ability to walk upright, but at the same time it was spending a lot of, uh, a lot of its life maybe foraging in trees uh, as well. And again, that goes against this opening of the landscape idea that, you know, it was the opening of the landscape that led to bipedalism because we already see uh, bipedal adaptations in forested environments. Now, not even that long ago, a, a, a month, maybe not even a few weeks ago, there was a reanalysis of some of the fossil material, mainly the hands um, and the feet. And, and what they're suggesting now is that uh, Artipithecus was maybe more suspensory than as opposed to sort of walking along tree branches on top. Now think more of a of uh, orangutan, and it likely was walking maybe along branches, but using its upper arms to sort of hold itself and, and suspend itself. Um, nevertheless, regardless if it was uh, fully bipedal or or only in kind of facultative bipedal here and there, uh, the environment suggests very dense sort of woodland still in East Africa at this time. And as we'll see with, with the slightly younger Australopithecus anamensis, about 4.2 or about 200,000 years after um, Artipithecus, 
which we know at this point was fully upright, fully bipedal, based on a lot of the, the fossil material. It too, based on other faunal remains from things like Galagos and, and Colobus monkeys, was living in a much denser sort of riparian forest environment along these streams going through, uh, or these river channels um, in, in Western Kenya. Uh, and we know that at this point, bipedalism was, was, had, had evolved in our earliest ancestors. Um, and, and then a few, you know, a few hundred thousand years later, uh, with the most famous of all, Australopithecus afarensis, you know, the Lucy fossil um, that was found in the, the late 70s. Um, we have not only the, the fossil remains, the morphological evidence, but the late holy footprints, you know, the, these 3.7 million year old uh, footprints in northern Tanzania that were made in this sort of this ashy mud unit. And we have these, I, I think it's been... Uh, debated, but like three individuals of the species walking, you know, a couple kilometers uh, across this East African environment, um, and they were 100% at this point bipedal. Uh, so 3. million or 3.7 million years ago, you know, bipedalism had evolved, and this is what six, 6.3 or so million years after East Africa started opening up. But again, uh, Australopithecus afarensis still retain these kind of arboreal adaptations. If we look at the upper morphology, it had these long arms, these sort of rounded uh, shoulder joints and, and large hands and feet. So uh, they were probably still spending a lot of time in trees, uh, maybe for foraging or, or just protection, you know, kind of getting away from predators. But then when they needed to, to move around or, or sort of go to you know, other foraging areas or whatever, on the ground, they were they were bipeds. They they walked walked around eh, no problem. Kind of like you and I today, their gait was a little bit different. Their hip structure was a bit different, um, but they still had these adaptations for living in, in forested or, or woodland environments. Uh, and and what's really interesting about you know Australopithecus is that this really is the first species that we start seeing. Uh, exploitation of, of more complex environments. And what I mean by that is, I'm talking about them living in forests and they have these adaptations to living in woodlands or forests, but we know now from different uh, paleoenvironmental records that they had spread throughout East Africa and, and a cousin species that lived a little bit younger uh, down in South Africa were in all, all sorts of different environments. So already, you know, heterogeneous environments with going from forest to open woodland to, to uh, riparian zones uh, were already being exploited by, by our earliest ancestors. So if we look at uh, Hadar in, in um, Ethiopia, uh, the environmental reconstruction suggests that, that Australopithecus afarensis here was living in sort of a seasonal floodplain along a river with some forest environment, but right nearby was sort of an open woodland. Um, so they were probably going back and forth between the different biomes for exploiting different food resources. And then if we look sort of at Laetoli, uh, Laetoli was much more open and, and a bit drier. But again, we know that they were walking uh, long distances and were probably experiencing quite a few different environments. Um, and then if we go to the South Africa with Australopithecus africanus, who was, uh, again, slightly younger in the fossil record, a bit larger uh, brains, the brain case was a bit more round. Um, some of the, the lower morphological features were different, but they were still sort of suspensory um, and, and living in trees as well. Uh, and that shows as their, their, one of their uh, habitats was reconstructed as a dense forest something like you would see in you know, tropical Central Africa today. So kind of to, to summarize, 3.7 and, and really up until about 2.2 million years ago or so, or, or 3 million years ago, um, early Australopithecines were bipedal and they were moving in and out of a whole bunch of different types of um, environments. Uh, so it wasn't just, you know, it got drier, it got warmer, and that led to bipedalism. It was really this environmental complexity probably foraging along these different habitat types um, that sort of had some 
some, you know, more uh, uh, kind of a push or whatever, if you will, uh, into the, the genus that would then become, become human. Uh, we're going to stay in South Africa for a minute because South Africa really has an incredible fossil record going back the last three million years. And there were, you know, times of, of species overlap, um, whether it was, you know, Australopithecus africanus, Australopithecus sediba, or Paranthropus, sort of all living at the same time. Uh, also, you know, Homo erectus. Uh, so we'll look at, at, at some of this uh, quickly. And then I, I also have Homo naledi up here um, because it's a really fa famous fossil that was found not too long ago, uh, 2015. Um, and although it only lived 200, 300,000 years ago, uh, I, I, it's kind of cool because it, it might have been around when early Homo sapiens evolved. Uh, so this paper came out, I think, in, in October, November of last year. Um, and again, it's looking at sort of environmental complexity uh, in the face of climate change in southern Africa and how we had these sort of these big shifts between dry and wet periods starting at about 2.6 million years and then sort of becoming a little bit more rapid about 2.2 million years uh, in down at the cradle of humankind in, in sort of northeast South Africa. And one of the big takeaways from this paper um, was that when looking at the different fossil material of Paranthropus robustus from, you know, Dremelin and, and Swartkrans and Sturkfontein, what they saw was local, you know, microevolutionary adaptations coinciding with different in, uh, ecological changes. So as opposed to, you know, what some have, have thought of as maybe sexual dimorphism or, or things like that, what they're now suggesting is that instead of these species you know, there were males living at this one place and mostly females here, and that's all that shows up in the fossil record. No, what we're actually seeing is because the environment was actually diverse or quite different in these different locations, Paranthropus had these micro adaptations, whether it was in, you know, their chewing apparatus for different foods or basic size of, of you know, the skull structure or body plans. And a lot of that had to do with these, like I said, these micro uh, ecological um, Differences, and I think that's really cool. I think that's kind of really amazing when you think about it. That at this time, about two million years ago, you can look into the species fossil record and see changes coincide, coinciding with their local environment. And I and I think that's really really amazing. And and uh, even before uh, last year, there was another cool study that came out again looking at these kind of carbon and hydrogen isotope changes with plant waxes off of uh, southeastern Africa in the Limpopo River Valley. Um, and they actually kind of ident identified some of these changes in hydroclimate and how things were changing locally. And it was slightly after 2 million years when things got drier that we see the extinction of Australopithecus africanus. And, and I think that's really fascinating is that this sort of shows that maybe they weren't suited to adapt to these rapid changes, whereas things like Paranthropus and then, of course, Homo erectus, you know, they're still around, they're still evolving. And then slightly after this time, Homo erectus sort of spreads throughout, throughout the old uh, uh, Africa and Eurasia. And, and that's sort of what I wanted to show here is that, um, like I said early on, by at least 1.8, if not earlier, Homo erectus was, was able to withstand such environmental changes that these earlier species might not have been able to do. Um, and because of that, they were able to sort of migrate into all these different areas uh, and experience all these different climate change, uh, climates uh, because of these different environmental changes, going to higher latitudes during periods of glaciation. Uh, so really cool. So there's definitely something different about the genus Homo. Um, and I hadn't really talked about Homo habilis going back about 2.8, um, but there's something really significant about the genus Homo and their ability to adapt to these changing landscapes. And, and one thing that we're gonna look at now uh, is maybe it has to do with tool use and the ability to exploit different food resources based on stone tools. So we're gonna go back to East Africa and we're gonna look at uh, Olduvai Gorge for uh, a little bit. Um, this is where I did my PhD and, and I do a little bit of work here now. Um, but Olduvai is famous because of what Lewis and Mary Leakey had discovered throughout the 19th uh, throughout the 20th century, excuse me, 
with the discovery of Homo habilis and then uh, Paranthropus boisei, and it sort of shifted the focus of human evolution studies to East Africa from Eurasia. Uh, and we're going to focus on uh, the Western Gorge, uh, a, a kind of an understudied part of, of Old Dubai. Um, most of the f attention has been on the kind of the confluence of the Central Gorge, and that's really where a lot of the fossil remains have been found. Uh, but we want to look at out in the West today um, at the earliest uh, evidence of human occupation and stone tool use. So we're going back nearly two million years. Uh, and if you see down here, this is a site called Iwas Oldapa, which in the local Maasai language uh, means on the way to Oldapai or on the way to the gorge. Um, and we're looking at these sort of these trenches down here, this T7, T7 West. And these are the oldest uh, known archaeology in the gorge as of now. And we have these sort of typical Oldowan uh, spheroids and some choppers and these, these sort of these pounding tools that we know they show up earlier in the fossil record going back uh, 2.8 million years, just about 2.6, 2.8 million years. But uh, at Old Divide, we only have records going back about 2 million. And this is some of the earliest, earliest uh, human evidence in all of the gorge. And even then, with likely Homo habilis, but it is possible uh, Paranthropus boisei was out here as well, that after these sort of geologic events, um, which put down the, 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 the geologic tufts, the way we date the gorge, um, starting about two million years ago, we have these, these eruptions. And then as you have sort of a post-eruptive fern colonizing species coming on the landscape, right away we see humans in the area exploiting what I think is probably plant resources. Um, and, and then they stay. And then as the, the landscape sort of rebound, and you get these woodlands and, and palms and fern mosaics. Humans are still there exploiting the, the plant resources then. And then at 2 million years, we have another um, sort of volcanic eruption. And that gives us our lower bed one. And then afterwards, we have sort of maybe something changed in the hydrology, differences in rainfall or differences in precipitation patterns uh, and, and sort of stream channels and whatnot. Um, then we have this kind of this grasslands that open up. But again, uh, Homo habilis or whatever species was there was again exploiting the environment all throughout these changes. So environmental adaptability was probably inherent in our species going back two and a half or 2.6 million years. And I think we have some great evidence for that uh, at Old Divide. Um, so, so these earliest hominins in this region, they were occupying heterogeneous and unstable environments. Uh, and they were ad adapted to these major geomorphic or, or ecological transformations early on, so even before we see Homo, Homo erectus. And then if we look a little bit younger in time to about 1.7 at the at sort of more in the central part of the gorge at the earliest Acheulean, and the Acheulean differs from the older one in that we have these hand axe and cleaver tools um, that were very multi-purpose, and these were used by Homo erectus uh, up until, what, I don't know, a couple hundred thousand years ago, and we're still being used into the Middle Stone Age, um, and really diverse uh, stone tools that had a lot of applications for, you know, butchery or digging or chopping or, or, or uh, hide working or, or debarking trees and all these different, different things. Um, and if we look at the earliest uh, location at Old Divai, where we have the the Acheulean at this site called FLK West, that's about 1.7 to 1.66 million years. Again, we see hominins or Homo erectus uh, concentrating their behavior in this sort of dense woodland environment, as we can see with our uh, carbon isotope record, that in the early layers where C3, you know, kind of a more forested environment dominates, you have a buildup of uh, the lithic artifact assemblage and then also human modified bones. And what's interesting is that the bones themselves, the ones that are being modified, aren't being modified by those hand axes or cleavers, but flakes coming off um, the, the original core that were to made, make them. So it gets us thinking, okay, so if, if they're not really using those, these bigger stone tools for butchering animals or cutting meat off bones, what were they using for? What were they using them for? And what we find is, is uh, sort of a micro residue analysis of, of coming off the, the stones are these starch granules or these fossilized starch granules 
from uh, Dioscorea, which is a, a tuber. It's a kind of a climbing tuber. Uh, sorry, it's a climbing plant, uh, but that has underground storage organs or tubers that grow in the ground. And we now think that Homo erectus was probably using these tools to dig up you know, tubers um, for another source of, of carbohydrates or, or energy you know, beyond meat. They were supplementing their diet or maybe even driving their diet with plant matter. And I think that's really cool. Um, but as you see, as then we get to the top of the, the sort of our sequence here, as the landscape opens up, um, the significance of the site sort of drops off. Maybe it was too open or maybe the plant, because the plants changed, then Homo erectus goes, you know, somewhere else in the gorge. There are a few other sites that are contemporaneous uh, around this point. So I think that's kind of cool um, evidence of how, you know, Homo erectus and then slightly before in the last slide, Homo habilis were exploiting these different environments uh, with different stone tools. And I mean, we don't really see that. Uh, it's not saying that didn't happen. We don't really see that with these early hominin species, Australopithecus, uh, maybe potentially with Paranthropus, but we don't have the solid evidence yet. Okay, and then just to finish up, uh, I know I'm kind of jumping quite a bit uh, ahead in time here. I did want to look at the sort of the Middle Stone Age about 400,000 years ago, because um, it's slightly after this point, modern humans, Homo sapiens, show up in the African fossil record around 300,000, and these we got much more complex tools, um, sort of smaller in size, but we also get things like blades, um, and, and really cool things, uh, Lavalua, stuff like this, so, so uh, a bunch of different tools. And another paper that came out towards the end of last year also suggested that it was this sort of transition from, you know, kind of a stable environment, uh, you know, a grassy woodland. And this is uh, from a site in Kenya. Um, and then at about 400,000 years ago, there's like kind of a complete turnover in terms of the climate and the environment going from a woodland and then grassland and then kind of back and forth. And we see that a, a tool replacement uh, as well as a species replacement um, going from the Etrurian to the Middle Stone Age, and then slightly after 300,000 years, we see the, the evidence of Homo sapiens in the region. And this led the authors to su suggest that, you know, early evidence of this kind of response to changing environment, changing climate, this fluctuating climate and environment, was a fun fundamental aspect of human Homo sapiens adaptability. But as we had just saw with our last slides, uh, I would actually change that and say it's not a fundamental aspect of human or Homo sapiens African origin, but our genus as a whole, going back to Homo erectus and probably even Homo habilis. Um, so basically to sum up, there is something sort of unique in our genus's ability to adapt to these changing environments, whether it's tool use or, or something else, just the ability to exploit different foods. Um, but we see going back at least two million years, if not earlier, that our genus has been very adaptable to climate change and environmental change. Um, and whether or not, I mean, I, I guess trying to tie it all together, how that really influenced human evolution, if at all, is still something that we still need to work out. But regardless, um, the, these environmental changes were not a barrier to our species or our genus's uh, evolution over the last two million years. And of course, we definitely see that as, oops, excuse me, as we sort of migrate, our genus migrates into Eurasia, and then things get really complex in the last 100 or 200,000 years when we have Homo sapiens and Neanderthals and Denisovans, and they're sort of all throughout Eurasia, and they're, they're intermingling and, and are, have like sort of this, this gene flow. And I, I think you know, this gets really complicated in terms of human cultural adaptations and, and what it meant when you're running into these other social groups but also at the same time, you're doing this across a whole different you know, assortment of environments, going from dry, you know, open woodland to, from East Africa to highlands uh, and even like you know, high altitude environments um, like the, the, the Denisovans, or even out to tropical forests in Central Africa or even Southeast Asia. And then again, out in front of glaciers in sort of like a boreal forest type or tundra type landscape, and again, at this, at this point, you know, climate is really you, you, you fluctuating or the environments are really fluctuating, but, but humans, you know, Homo sapiens and Neanderthals, uh, we were able to exploit tons of different resources and it really didn't seem to be a barrier to us at least 
I think we're still trying to work out what it was that sort of ended Neanderthals in the, in the fossil record, uh, whether it was climate or, or something else. Um, so I, I just like to thank you all for, for, again, thank you for inviting me. I know that was a lot of information in sort of a short amount of time. Um, but I hope it gave you kind of a, an interesting overview of how it wasn't just a simple transition from you know, closed to open landscape that sort of drove human evolution, but really the ability to adapt to fluctuations over long periods of time um, by exploiting microhabitats with stone tools, you know, in an ever-changing ever